All right. This was the worst war in African history. More people died in this civil war than anybody and than any other conflict. You understand? And uh I think that you need to know this history because um I just think you need to understand that. Okay, what you're about to see right now is, okay, so the north of Nigeria, Islamic. That guy right there was the leader of the north. They called them the Fulani. That's the name of the tribe. South, Igbo. Igbo, I think they were Christians. They, they're Christian, okay? So the Igbo, business-minded. Fulani, religious-minded. They do nothing but pray all day and follow Islam all day. So naturally... They can't compete with the business people because the business people are secular and they're not praying all day. They're, you know, back then they, they had a very basic understanding of religion. You had to be religious or you had to be a regular person. They chose to be religious. So they were jealous of the evil. Check it out. Nigerian, but on contract too. This is going to be a permanent, I should say, for the, as far as I can post. The one thing I've noticed, Femi, when I've been here, is that Northerners seem to have, I mean, I almost call it obsession about the Igbos. Could you perhaps explain that to me? Well, the Igbos are more or less the type of people whose desire is mainly to dominate everybody. If they go to a village, to a town, they want to monopolize everything in that area. If you put them in a labor camp as a laborer, Within a year, they will try to emerge as headman of that camp, and so on. Well, in, in the past, our people were not alive to their responsibilities, because you can see from our northernization policy that in 1952, when I came here, there weren't 10 northerners in our civil service here. Then I tried to have it northernized, and now all, all important posts are being held by northerners. Juku's mind was made up. He proceeded to consult with the various chiefs and traditional rulers of the eastern region, and on the 30th of May 1967, Ojuku officially announced the secession of the eastern region and the establishment of the state of Biafra. And with the support of many key members of the southeastern leadership, Colonel Ojuku cut all ties with the Nigerian army and was proclaimed General Ojuku, Biafran president. And I right, saw so he was trained by the Nigerian military, but see, oil was found in Biafran land. Problem is, Biafrans only make up a tiny percent. You know, there's the other tribes are bigger. So what happens is, they take their oil and they don't give them a fair portion of it, and they look at this as armed struggle. You're taking the oil from right under us, and you're not giving us any of it. The commander in chief of the Biafran army. The declaration of Biafra's secession was celebrated in the streets. For many. The establishment of Biafra was a long-awaited restoration of the pre-colonial sovereignty of the region and the beginning of a bright new dawn for its people. But unfortunately, the celebrations will be short-lived as the Nigerian government's response was to declare war on Biafra. And although the Biafran army had no air force, no navy, and a chronic shortage of weapons and manpower, General Ojuku was surprisingly optimistic about his new nation's ability Nigerian to army. understand the Nigerian army. He's a leader army. and president. But he was the leader of the military. He eventually became president. He's still alive, I think. He's in his 80s. This guy right here is one of the most historic Africans of all time, man. You need to know this information. Check this out. This is very emotional. They were ready ready to die for the Biafran If cause. civil war comes, and I do think it is imminent, you're quite right. It will for us be the price of freedom. Our people here have for a long time been prepared for this eventuality and I am confident of their readiness. I think that when it does come, the people on the other side would be surprised. And because of this war, this Nigerian civil war, you know, the stereotypical image of the starving African that on television shows and commercials, it started with this war. The, the level of mayhem and destruction was so big, so pronounced 
for the first time, people in the Western world were seeing these starving African children, these starving Biafran children. And that's where that imagery comes from of the starving African child. That trope comes from this war. As to what they're going to get. And I'm confident that it will not last long. I can't say for certain what Lagos has got. Um, when we lost direct contact with Lagos, they had some four battalions ill-equipped and um, I know that they have been purchasing a lot of arms since. And I know that they have negotiated and received a few armored vehicles. Prior to that, they had some scout cars. Of the starving African child. Yeah. Honestly? All right, hang on for a couple more seconds, okay? You need to know this, man. This is very, very... Very, very important. Although the Nigerian government strategy was indefensible, it is important to point out that the government's opposed reasoning at the time was that the blockade would be nothing more than a short, sharp shock, and that General Ojuku, seeing the immense suffering of his people and the dwindling ammunition of his frontline soldiers, would have no other choice but to surrender. So they starved the children and starved the people because they tried to break this general's will. Show me who makes makes a profit from war, and I'll show you how to stop that war. And all of this was over oil, man. They first discovered these large oil deposits, and the Biafrans wanted their cut. They wanted their cut. However, what the Nigerians had failed to realize was that the Biafran state had secured the support of a foreign benefactor of its own. Although the only countries to publicly recognize the state of Biafra were Tanzania, Gabon, the Ivory Coast, Zambia, and Haiti. Charles de Gaulle's France had taken a secret interest in Biafra. And remember I told you, European governments, they want a piece of that action. So they're going to play the background. I honestly believe... Nigerian side. It is in the true interest of the Igbos that they return to the fatherland. I'm satisfied that all other Nigerians have learned the lesson of our most recent history and the current civil war. And I pray to God that there will never be a repetition. You see, contrary to popular belief, the Biafran government was much more than just a rebel military force. General Ojuku also assembled a group of elite writers and artists who were tasked with cultivating nationalist spirit at home and also spreading Biafra's message on the world stage. Political cartoons were put up all around the country, pushing simplistic interpretations of the causes of the war and demonizing not just the Nigerian military, but the Nigerian populace at large. On the international stage, notable members of the Biafran apparatus, such as Chinua Achebe and Gabriel Okara, publicized the plight of the Biafran people. They regularly denounced the actions of the Nigerian government and spoke about the atrocities they had witnessed in the country. The Biafran story became front page news, and more and more members of the international community began to call on their own governments to take action. On the 29th of May 1969, Bruce Mayrock, an American student at Columbia University, set himself on fire at the United Nations headquarters in New York in protest of what he believed was a genocide against the nation and people of Biafra. And that's why I told you it was important. A young man killed himself, self-immolation because he, he felt for the Biafrans. A white man killed himself, committed suicide because he thought it was wrong. Peace.